Hi again, Calc BC. Welcome back. Uh, we are moving on. We're getting out of the AB review. Um, obviously, there have been a few things along the way that haven't been AB, but uh, we're getting into the big difference uh, between BC and AB now. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be pressing on into chapter eight, and so um, this is gonna feel really weird, like a big um, left turn, like away from calculus for a little while here. Uh, and, and in, in some ways it, it is, uh, but it all comes back together at the end. And so, um, I think, uh, I think in, in the end of chapter eight, you'll see why calculus was necessary for this. But, um, at first it's going to feel a little bit like, oh, okay, this isn't, this isn't derivatives and this isn't integration. This is, um, something quite a bit different. Uh, and what we're going to move into are the chapter eight is all about, um, uh, sequences and series. Specifically, um, the goal is to be able to um, take some functions that maybe are complicated, ugly, hard to hard to integrate, hard to hard to work with, and maybe rewrite them as a series. And um, in, in doing so, making them easier to work with. Uh, the series that we're going to be writing them is going to be like uh, we're turning them into polynomials and. We love polynomials, right? Because polynomials are continuous and differentiable everywhere. And um, you know, given given enough time, it doesn't matter how big the polynomial is, you can derive or integrate it. It's just a um, matter of going term by term. So uh, that's kind of where we're headed. That's what chapter eight is all about. Uh, but we start off with uh, sequences, and so um, a sequence is kind of you know, like it sounds, it's just a sequence of terms. And so um, let me. Uh, jump over here to our whiteboard. And so typically um, we're gonna use some notation that says, uh, you know, when I define a sequence, uh, I usually write it like, you know, um, A sub N, you know, with some fancy brackets on it. And they'll give me, um, you know, a lot of times they give us some function of N where N is an integer. Okay, um, it's in the set of integers. And so um, starting with one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, usually then what we get is we get, you know, A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on, all the way up to A sub n. All right, um, and that nth, that is called the nth term, nth term, there we go, of our sequence. And so a lot of the times when we're looking at sequences, uh, you know, we won't, we'll, we'll be interested in the first, you know, however many finite number of terms. Um, but a lot of times um, what we're, what we're really interested in is that in that nth term. So uh, just real uh, briefly, just so we get a chance to kind of try it out. Uh, let's take a look at an nth term. Uh, so here's my sequence for my first one, a sub n. And I'm going to give, um, this is uh, 3 plus negative 1 to the nth power. All right. And so what do, uh, what do those terms of that sequence look like, right? Well, um, you know. Let's see, uh, what's the first term of our sequence then? A1, well, that's three plus negative one to the first, so that's obviously two. What's A2? Well, that's three plus negative one to the second power, so that's gonna be four. A3, three plus negative one to the third, that's going back to two, and so on and so forth. Um, now it gets hard to figure out what a sub n is, right? Is it going to be a four or a two? So I don't know. Um, and in a minute, we're going to define something called the limit of a sequence. And clearly, um, this one wouldn't have one because we don't know what are the terms approaching a value or what. But um, that's just our first example. Um, example one, right? Um, let's try another one. Let's do uh, another example over here, example two. This time, uh, the terms of my sequence, 
uh, b sub n. Uh, let's see, I've changed the variable name. That's okay. Uh, that's going to be n over 1 minus 2n. Okay, so let's write out a few terms of this sequence, right? So what's b1 going to be? Well, that's 1 over 1 minus 2 times 1. Well, 1 over 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Okay, what's b2 going to look like? Well, that's going to be 2 over 1 minus 2 times 2. Okay, well, um, that's going to be negative 2 over 3. Okay. And then b3, well, that's going to be 3 over 1 minus 2 times 3. All right, negative 3 over 5. And so on and so forth. And that's um, you know, now we might be starting to think about, okay, so is that particular sequence of terms going somewhere, right? Um, you know, again, you know, like I said, we, a lot of times what we're concerned with is what's happening at that nth term. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and define that right now. Um, you know, when we talk about the limit of a sequence, okay, what we're, what we're talking about here is do, do the terms of the sequence, um, you know, converge to a, a specific value. So um, this idea of convergence is going to be huge for us all throughout chapter eight. Um, you know, when we write this, the limit as n approaches infinity, that's supposed to be an infinity symbol, for a sub n equals L. Okay, what do we mean? Well, we mean that as n gets infinitely large, right? the the values of the sequence approach a specific number okay um and we say that if this is true this is true then the series is said to converge Okay. Well, if I take a look back at the previous page, right, example one clearly doesn't converge, right, because it goes 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, back and forth all the way uh, on up to infinity, right? It just keeps alternating between the 2 and the 4. Okay, So that one clearly does not um, converge because it's not approaching a specific value. Okay. Um, what about the example two? You know, if I think about that in terms of like uh, you know, um, actually taking a limit, you know, the limit as n approaches infinity, for example, two, oops, sorry, that was b sub n, right? We're talking about the limit as n approaches infinity of n over one minus two sub n. Can, can you, think of a way we could actually evaluate this limit, right? Isn't this gonna be an infinity over an infinity case? I mean, it's infinity over negative infinity, but still, yeah. Could could try a L'Hopital's rule on this one. Um, you could even just do a even more basic, multiply by one, and notice what that gives us, n approaches infinity of one over one over n, <laughs> it's supposed to be an n one over n minus two and sure enough the one over n term goes to zero and we get negative one half so example two's um limit is negative one half so that would be a series that does converge um example one was a series that um does not converge and so, um, you know, we can figure out how to get this series to converge just using the same ideas that we had uh, previously for our, for our limits. Now, technically speaking, right, n was an integer value, right? So it wasn't really like a continuous thing, right? It was, it was very much discrete along the way. Um, when you look at uh, page uh, 557, check out theorem, uh, 550 on 557 it's uh 8.1 uh it talks about how okay 
That's true. So think of it in terms of uh, a function x of x, and that's exactly the same as our function for n here. And it basically does the same thing. So instead of working with the series, well, use this function. Okay. We'd evaluate it in the same way. Um, and so they're just talking about how, um, you know, if you're, if you're stuck, if you're like, okay, I, I understand that n has to be integers. So how can we take the limit as n goes to infinity using the same kind of things as we did before? Um, this is why you can just exchange it for a function of x uh, and find the same limit. They'll be, they will be the same. Okay. Um, some properties of limits of sequences. Uh, you'll find these uh, on 558. There's a whole list of them there. Um, page 558, theorem 8.2. Uh, lists out a few properties of, 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 of these things. I don't think you're going to find it too terribly exciting. Um, it's just like, you know, uh, if you have two series or two sequences added together that both converge to find the, the limit of the sum, you can just take each one separately and find the sum of the two limits. Um, if you put a constant inside, um, that's, that one's actually pretty handy. Uh, so if you're doing the limit as n approaches infinity and they've taken some constant and multiplied it by the terms of your sequence, you can pull the constant out. Like so. Um, anyway, there's there's a couple of them in there. I'm not going to go through them all, um, but they are there are uh, nice properties in there for you to be able to figure out um, how those how those work. Um, we get we get introduced to an idea in here, or maybe reintroduced to an idea here of factorial. Um, the factorial is going to show up a lot as we work our way through chapter eight. So. A quick review of factorial here. Um, re remember, uh, you know, it's it looks like this, right? Okay, it's not a really emphatic like five, right? You know, it means something mathematically, right? It's the product of five times the integers uh, below it, so. You know, you can just multiply them together. Um, these things do start to show up quite a bit in um, in our work in sequences and series. So, uh, you know, don't be surprised to start seeing, you know, the the terms of the sequence, you know, look like one over n factorial, right? So, you know, if a sub n looks like that, you know, what is that? What do the terms of that sequence look like? You know, well, it's you know one a sub one is one over one factorial. Remember, you know, one factorial equals one, right? Also remember, zero factorial also equals one. It's a defined to be one. Um, so you'll see we'll see stuff like this a lot. Okay, um, a one. You know, what's a two going to be then? Oh, that's going to be one half. What's a three going to be? Well, you know, that's one over three factorial, which is one sixth. Um, you know, what's a four going to be? Well, that's one over four factorial. You know, so that's one twenty fourth and so on, like so. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, <clears throat> review that factorial just in, it does show up quite a lot in our work. <clears throat> Here we go. Just a little sip of water there. Sorry, guys. Um, OK, so. Uh, as we play around with, with different sequences and things, um, we are probably going to see factorial show up. Uh, there's a whole pattern recognition that goes with series and stuff and sequences, and um, we're going we're gonna to be using factorials a lot. I should, I should mention, I, I, I've said sequences and series a lot. Sequences are just the terms themselves, okay? 
series is when you add them up and you you've probably done some work on series and sequences before but i just want to make sure just in case anybody wasn't sure what the difference is um you know when we write out sequences you know we're just talking about you know a1 a2 a3 and so on and so forth b1 b2 b3 b4 okay the series okay is when we would add a1 plus a2 plus a3 and so on b1 plus b2 plus b3 and so on. okay so uh, i keep saying it because um you know, sequences and series are usually tied together quite a bit so um ah so um moving on <laughs> um a, a monotonic sequence. Okay, so uh, monotonic sequences are sequences where the terms of the sequence, um, well, one of two things that happens. Um, there is either a non decreasing one, so non decreasing. So that's where, you know, A1 is greater than or equal to, uh, sorry, started the non-increasing one. A1 is less than or equal to A2, less than or equal to A3, less than or equal to all the way up A sub N. That's what we mean by non-decreasing. Okay, you're like, well, why don't we just call it increasing? Well, they could all be equal. Okay, and we'd still be considered monotonic. Um, you could have a non-increasing, Okay, so that was the one I started to write at first. A1 is greater than A2, greater than A3, A3 greater than or equal to A4, and so on, greater than or equal to A sub n. That's a non-increasing one. So there we go. Some some kind of weird verbiage there, but uh, but it kind of makes sense because you know it could be that the terms are equal to each other, and we would still call that a monotonic sequence. Um, so uh, my very first. Uh, sequence you know a a sub n here you know that would not be monotonic right that's going increasing it goes up to four then it goes down to two then it goes up to four down to two that's not that's not monotonic okay um what about b though is b monotonic right we were at negative one then we were at negative two thirds okay then we're at negative three fifths okay then we're at negative um four sevenths right and so is that one monotonic? And yeah, it is. It's a non-decreasing one. Um, those terms are increasing each time. Okay. So that would be a monotonic sequence. Um, you know, but where where the, the terms are continuing to go uh, in one direction each time. So um, that's what we mean by monotonic. Now, bounded sequence, okay, bounded has there's there's a there's a couple of couple of definitions here. So one is that um, a, a sequence uh, a sub n uh, is bounded above uh, if there exists a real number We'll call it M, uh, such that A sub N is less than or equal to M um, for all N. Okay. And we call that M, M is called the upper bound. Two, A sub n is bounded below if there exists a real number n. such that a sub n is greater than or equal to n 
for all n. n is the lower bound. Okay. Finally, a sub n is said to be bounded if it is bounded above and below. Boy, that's a lot of writing. Uh, that's all. That's all in uh, the definition of, of a bounded sequence on five thirty six. Um, yeah, writing that out makes me realize why mathematicians have symbols for most of those words. So, uh, yeah, we have we have a we have a whole like shorthand of our own here. So, um, I kind of wish I would teach you guys that early on in the year, so then I could write these things out faster. Because you know, there's a nice symbol that means there exists. Um, such that for all, <laughs> there's, there's symbols that mean all that stuff if you use it. Yeah, it's not worth it now. Um, all right. The, um, uh, the important part of this is if we have a sequence that is monotonic, but it is also bounded, okay, then we know it is convergent. Okay, so um, the idea of convergence, like I said earlier, is going to become huge for us as we as we work our way through chapter eight. You're going to see that once we get into sequences a little bit further, and really when we get into series, series that we're really concerned with, does that series converge? Um, and there's all these different tests that we have that we've developed different ways to test our series to see if it is in fact convergent or if it's divergent. Um, and so one of the big things that we we're going to look at is this, you know, is the sequence um, convergent. And so one of the ways to prove that it is convergent is to prove that it's monotonic and bounded. And, you know, you can see now where um, if we have that idea of a, of a sequence has a limit, you know, then we can say, well, okay, so now we know it's bounded above, we know um, or below, whatever that limit is. And then we can say, well, look, it's monotonic. Um, and so we can go, okay, yeah, that, this, this is starting to feel like this, this is a convergent sequence. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. So if we can prove that it's monotonic and it's bounded, then we can prove that that sequence is um, convergent. And we don't have to go through the limit process to do so. And that's important because uh, factorials, remember those guys we talked about, they're not easy um, to prove uh, with a limit because there is no function of X that we can model that with. Um, that is very much a discrete math sort of idea that, that we can't get away from. So, um, you know, uh, the idea that we could then somehow use a, a sequence um, that with a factorial in it to prove that we have a, a convergent sequence is a pretty big deal. So um, that's what this is all about. Um, the uh, there's proofs for all these theorems, and I'm not I'm not going through the proofs for you. I, I'm going on the assumption that you can read them. Um, the proof for theorem eight five is a, a good one on five uh, sixty three. Uh, because it really does talk about a lot about why it's important that it's bounded above and below. Um, and uh, the fact that it's monotonic uh, proves, proves something. So uh, I will uh, let you guys uh, peruse that when you get a chance. Um, so, you know, we'll just look at a couple of quick sequences here. Um, here's one. Okay, so is this sequence bounded? All right, um, well, let's see. Uh, you know, what's a sub one? Well, it's one. Okay, what's a sub two? Well, it's one half. And a sub three, 
is one third. So uh, what do you notice? Um, it never gets, it's never going to get bigger than one, right? So we have a uh, bounded above. by one. Um, so um, is it bounded above by a, by a lot of different things? Um, yes, it is. Okay. And so, um, but usually what we want to talk about here is something called the least upper bound. And so the idea here is to figure out what is the smallest number, um, you know, that is bounded above by. Um, because, you know, in the case of one over n, right, you could have picked it, I could have picked anything, as long as it was greater than one. Um, but we, we usually will report that it's bounded above by what's called the least upper bound, uh, the smallest integer, or well, doesn't be an integer, but the, the smallest value that it is above when you start plugging in the integer values for n, see which one it is. Okay, bounded above by one. What about below? Is it bounded below? Um, yeah, it is bounded below, right? Okay, these these terms are are, are always going to be positive, right? They're getting smaller, but they're but they're always positive. Um, the fact that they're getting smaller means what? Well, it's monotonic, right? Is it monotonic? Sure, yeah, it's a non-increasing. Sorry, yes, it's non-increasing. So it's bounded above by one, below by zero. So it is bounded. Okay, it's monotonic, yes. So what do we know for sure? Oh, we know the sequence A sub N converges by theorem 8.5. Um, so that's what theorem 8.5 allows us to do is to um, show the convergence of a series without having to worry about the limit. Now, could I have done the limit on this one? Oh, yeah, I could have. Okay. In fact, that's kind of how I knew it was zero, right? <laughs> for the for the lower bound. Um, but you didn't have to do that if you could prove that it was monotonic and bounded above and below. So uh, that will be uh, part of our work here as we get ready to go into uh, the work here on page uh, 564. So there we go, guys. That's a lot about uh, sequences. Uh, next time, um, we're going to take those sequences and turn them into series. And uh, that's where the real work in chapter eight starts to begin. Um, because again, the idea of convergence of a sequence, you know, allows us to just look at the terms themselves. But when we move to a series where we start adding those terms up, you know, is it possible to add up an infinitely large string of numbers and get a finite value? Good question, right? And, and what does it have to look like if that's going to happen? Or is that impossible to do? Uh, and that's the subject matter for the video next week. Uh, now, I, I realize that there's no class Monday, Tuesday next week. So uh, your next video is not for um, until Thursday. Um, but hopefully uh, that video uh, will, will be uh, enough for us to explain how that works. So, all right, and we'll see you guys in class. Thanks.